All right, let's take a look at multidimensional arrays. It turns out that C doesn't really have any such thing as a multidimensional array. It has only one-dimensional arrays. Uh, and a two-dimensional array is really just a one-dimensional array of one-dimensional arrays. So each element in that top-level array is really itself an array. And we can work similarly for higher dimensions. So we can have multidimensional arrays that are arrays of arrays of arrays and so forth to get higher dimensionality. As before, here's the declaration of a two-dimensional array. It's got a type T, so the individual elements in the array are of that type. The array itself is called A, and we've got R rows and C columns being defined here. So there's a couple of examples over here. Here's a ch char array, a character array called foo, that's got four rows and 12 columns, and an integer array called bar that's got 42 rows and 17 columns. And as you can see here, the type T uh, tells us the basic type that's being stored in each of the rows and columns of that array. If we look up here, we can see kind of the conceptual layout of the array. There's uh, the first element of the array is at row zero and column zero. That's this cell. And again, that cell might be different sizes based on the fundamental data type that we're storing in the array. So if it's an integer, that's four bytes worth. And that first row terminates here at A of 0, and then C minus 1 would be the column index, because there's C columns in the array. And then the beginning of the next row would be A of 1 comma 0, or A of 1, 0, and so forth, up to A of 1, C minus 1. When we get down to the lower left corner, we're now at A of R minus 1, and we've now, we're now at the rth row, and because it's indexed from 0, it's row R minus 1, column 0. And then the very last element of the array down here is A of R minus 1, C minus 1. We can see that the, uh, um, the elements uh, of each of the arrays is the size of the fundamental data type. So if, we've, if T is an array, tells us it's an array of integers, then the size of an integer is 4, which is going to make K equal to 4 in that example. So we're going to use this value k to talk about how much memory is actually being occupied by the array. And we can see right away, because these values are going to just be stored contiguously in memory, that the size of the array is going to be the number of rows times the number of columns times the number of bytes per element. So r times c times k. One of the most important characteristics of an array in C is it's stored in what's called row major order. This means that each of the rows is stored in memory before the beginning of the next row. So at the lowest address in memory, we'll find the first cell of the array, the one at array index 00. zero. And succeeding elements in memory are going to store the next columns of that same row. And when we reach the rightmost column of that first row, we're going to see in memory the next row, starting with its leftmost column and proceeding across to its rightmost column, and then we're going to see the third row and so forth until we get to the last row, which says that the last element in memory, that the highest memory address, is going to be the address that stores the final element of the array, the one at R minus 1, C minus 1. This is called row major order, again, because the rows are stored first and then the columns within the rows. It turns out that there's other languages, most notably the Fortran language, that stores arrays in column major order. And the choice is really sort of arbitrary, but it's important for us to know that C uses row major order because this is going to become very important when we start, start talking about how caching affects uh, the performance of algorithms as they traverse arrays. So here's another visualization of that. We can see that so this is, this is a picture of the memory that's occupied by this array, and the very lowest address here is the, the, the location where A of 0, 0 is stored. And we can see as we progress up through memory that the first a, a, a row is stored entirely before we begin the second row and so forth until we get to the last row, which is stored at the end of the memory segment allocated to this array, and the final element of the array, A of R minus 1, C minus 1, is the, the location or the value that's stored at the location at the highest memory address. And again, as we saw before, the amount of memory occupied by this array is going to be the number of rows times the number of columns times the size of each of the elements. We called this uh, variable k on the previous page. Okay, let's look at an example of a nested array, a two-dimensional array. 
We're going to start, uh, as we did before, with the one-dimensional array called zipdig. Again, this was a type def that basically gave us a simple way to identify an array of uh, integers called zipdig, and it's going to have uh, as a length zlen, which is just defined to be a constant of 5 here. So the, um, the type def here expands out to be entirely equivalent to an array of integers called tu that has five integers inside of it, and then the initializer remains the same. So let's extend that now to make an array of these arrays. So we're going to have another array called Grant County, and it's going to have p count entries in it. p count's just four here. I'm going to store basically the zip codes of four towns in Grant County in this array of arrays. So the the type in this case is actually a zip dig. Before we defined zip dig to mean an array of integers, and now we're going to create an array of zip digs. So the same syntax, right? We use the integer uh, to define the type of the array. Here we're saying we want the type of the array to be a zip dig. We're going to call it Grant County, and it's going to have p count elements in it. And the, the initializer here um, clarifies a little bit the notion that we have an array of arrays. So we've got some additional nesting going on here where these two curly braces are the delimiters for the Grant County array. But within that, we've got four additional arrays that are all of type zip dig. And if we think about what that's equivalent to, we can see that, uh, first of all, we've got a zip dig. Well, a zip dig is actually an array of integers. So at the end of the day, we're going to have an array that contains integers, and that's the way that the final declaration is equivalent to. It's still going to be called Grant County. And now Grant County, first of all, is itself an array of four things. That's where the four comes from. Each of those things is an array of five things, which comes from here. So that's where the five comes from, and then the initializer remains the same. Okay. So let's think about how this is allocated in storage. Here's our same uh, Grant County array of arrays. And as we can see here, it's an array that contains four arrays. And each of those arrays consists of five integers. So it's an array of arrays of integers. It's important, again, that note that these ar array elements are going to be allocated contiguously in memory. So that's what this diagram is intending to, to show. I've arbitrarily placed the first element of the array at address 76. Again, that's just a made up simple to reason with address. It's actually not going to be anywhere near that small in a real executing program on Unix, but that's fine for our purposes. You can see that we're storing things in row major order. If we look at 46989, that's the first row of our array. Those are the values that get stored in the first chunk of memory. So we've got uh, these these five integers, we know that integers are four bytes wide, so four bytes times five integers, this is going to be 20 bytes, and we can see as we go from the first element of the first row to the first element of the second row, we're incrementing by 20 bytes. And then we see the second row from our original data stored in the next 20 bytes of memory, and the third row and the fourth row, each of which are going to contain 20 bytes. Notice that there's no gaps or spaces in memory between these, these elements. The, uh, the compiler knows that because each of the elements is going to be four bytes wide because it's an integer, it can just pack those side by each into memory as we've pictured here. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to be able to access this array. Uh, first of all, we can actually refer to the individual row, row vectors. So if I want to talk about a of 0, or a of 1, or a of 2, I can refer to the location where that thing starts in memory. In the previous example, we were looking at, um, in, at indexing the individual elements of the array, uh, although we haven't really unpacked that yet. Uh, here, we're thinking about just picking out a particular row from the, from the array. Well, because we know that rows are stored in, sorry, that arrays are stored in row major order, um, and that the, at the sort of top level of the arrays of arrays, we have this array called A that has an array of arrays themselves in this case. So uh, each of the, if we want to figure out where each of the rows starts, like there's A of 0, there's A of i, or A of r minus 1, 
If we want to know where those rows begin, we can do some simple pointer arithmetic. So if the first location of our array is stored at address A, right, there's, there's the first row, A of 0, 0 to A of 0, C minus 1, we can uh, dope out a pattern that allows us to determine where the beginning of, of each of the rows falls in memory. So if we want to look for A sub I, that's that, uh, the ith row, we, we know that each of the, um, we know that each of the elements of the arrays corresponds to four bytes, because we know it's an integer. And we know that there's C columns in each row. Uh, so each of the each of the rows in memory is going to occupy C times four bytes. That's what we saw as 20 bytes in the previous page. Which means if we want to get to the ith row, the beginning of the ith row, we just have to take the size of each of those rows and multiply it times i. So this is going to give us a number that's then going to be used to do uh, uh, address arithmetic to offset the location of A to the appropriate spot in memory that corresponds to the beginning of row number I. Okay. Now we're thinking about this because we want to understand how the compiler is going to compile array indices into assembly language. So when we're talking about the code that's generated to access a particular row, a particular row vector like we just talked about, uh, this is what happens. Here's a little simple uh, function that gives us the, the point, a pointer to the beginning of the ith row of the array. So get grant county zip. We can give it an index into that grant county zip array, and it will give us back the beginning of the row, or the address of the beginning of the row that contains that particular zip code. So we're going to return Grant County of index. Now remember that Grant County is an array of arrays of integers. So its, its type is actually an int star star. That's Grant County. When we index into that, we're now removing one level of indirection. So the value that's going to come back from this return statement is actually going to be an int star, which is consistent with a declaration of this function. This is going to give us a pointer to an integer that happens to be the location of the beginning of the indexed row of that Grant County array. So here's code that will do that. Um, let's kind of unpack the, the, the process here. We're trying to figure out what this C code will generate, Grant County of index. Well, we know that we need to advance through memory 20 bytes times the index value, where 20 bytes is the size of each of the rows. There's five columns, each of which has four bytes, giving us 20, uh, uh, 20 bytes that we need to move, move forward. So Grant, we want to take Grant County plus 20 times that index. Well, the compiler is pretty smart. In particular, it wants to make use of this really cool arithmetic hardware that it has that knows how to compute these kinds of effective addresses. So rather than doing something like spinning up the multiply hardware to multiply 20 times this index value, the compiler actually is going to use the load effective address capabilities to make that calculation faster. So rather than, than doing 20 times the index, what it's going to do essentially is uh, multiply the index times 5, and then multiply that times 4. So in order to multiply times 5, we're going to do index times 4 plus the index, right? So that, that whole thing gives us index times 5. You can see that the way it does that uh, is shown in this first load effective address. Remember that the index value that comes in as the first argument to this function is going to get stored in RDI. That's just our register allocation conventions for function calling. So here in the load effective address calculation, we're taking RDI as our index, or excuse me, our base register, RDI also as our index register, and 4 as our scale factor. And the calculation that's performed, as we know, by this address, address uh, reference is going to be to take the base register plus the index register times 4, which is exactly this. The base register times the index register times 4. We happen to be using the same actual machine register 
RDI for both the base and the index, which means that the effect of this is going to just be to multiply the index in RDI times 5, and we're going to store that in RAX. Notice that because we're going to return this pointer, we just right away start using RAX as our working register because when we return uh, from this assembly code, the caller is going to expect the result to be in RAX. So, so far we've got 5 times the index. We also need, we, but we really want to get 20 times the index. So, we need to multiply again by 4. Well, we could do this in a couple ways. We could run the multiplication circuitry, which is time consuming. We could use a shift operation to shift by two binary places, or in this case, we're actually going to use the load effective address hardware again. So we're going to take the value that we had calculated in RAX, which was five times the index, and we're going to run it through the load effective address calculation uh, using four as our scale value. So we're basically taking, well, we don't have a first argument here, so that's basically going to mean zero plus RAX times four which is, as we've seen, Rx, or sorry, is index times 5 times 4, which gives us 20 times the index. That's this portion of the equivalent functionality. Notice in addition, so that just gives us basically the offset in the array of the beginning of the row at, at number index. But what we really want to do is get the offset from the beginning of the array. So I've included here a little picture that shows that Grant County, this identifier, is the address of the beginning of the array itself. And that shows up here in the second load effective address calculation. You remember that this is basically a displacement value that's going to be added on to whatever comes out of this address mode calculation. So whatever Grant County is, we don't know what it is right off the top, right off the top. someplace in memory is going to be used by the compiler to store this array, and the compiler will know what that is, and it's going to include that in the, the assembly language so that not only do we compute the offset properly based on the value of index, we also uh, base that calculation off of the beginning of the array so that we get the appropriate row from the underlying data. All right, given that information, um, we now know how to find a particular row in the array. But in most cases, we're not going to really be looking at the uh, individual rows. We want to be able to grab the elements in those rows. And we know because of the row major ordering storage that the, uh, the columns within a row are just at consecutive locations starting from the first column of the row. So if we're thinking about some, uh, some uh, column here inside of the first row, if we can find the location of the first byte of the row, and then offset that by the appropriate number of bytes to scooch over to the column that we're interested in, we can fetch out a particular element of the array, in this case a particular integer. So in order to uh, get after uh, array element a i of j, we know that we've got elements of type t that have k bytes worth of data. We've been using integers, so k is 4. And we know that um, when we as we see, see back here, we know that in order to begin, come up with the first part of the row, we want to be able to use the size of the elements times the first index, which is what's going on here. We, we're starting at the location of A. That's the first address of the first row, of the first column of the first row in the array. We're going to add to that the value of the first index, I, right, this guy, times the number of columns times the number of bytes per column. So this is going to get us to the first byte of the row. Now to access the jth element, the jth column of that row, we need to further advance through memory to the location of the beginning of the jth integer in this case. And we know that we want to skip forward uh, by j times the size of each integer, which is k here. So this will get us to the, the jth column of the row, right? So that whole address calculation is what needs to take place in order to access a specific element of the array. Okay. 
So let's look at some code that does that. Um, here's a, another access function, get Grant County digit. So the previous example was to get the Grant County zip code, which was going to be a pointer to an integer. Uh, here, we want to not only get the particular zip code at that index, but we want to get the digit at that offset. So you can see here inside the declaration here that we're going to we're going to go from the beginning of the Grant County array, skip over this many rows, and then get the digs column from within that row. And you notice that this is now an integer because although Grant County, back to the what I was showing you before, Grant County was actually an int star star. It's a pointer to a pointer to an integer. Grant County of say i has type pointer to integer and grant county of i j is actually just an integer right so each time we add on one of these references we're dereferencing the pointer each time until we get to the point where we're actually talking about integers so the fact that we've got two indices here in this expression means that this guy is going to actually be of type integer and then again, we know that the beginning of this array is stored at this Grant County location. Let's look at how the compiler will generate assembly language to do these array references then. So we're trying to get to Grant County of index dig. So the index tells us the zip code that we want to get to, and within that zip code, we want to get this digit. We know from the previous slides that in order to do that, we need to calculate the location at which that digit is stored in memory. And that's going to be the base address of the array plus 20 times the index, where 20 is the size of each of the columns, the number of bytes, sorry, the size of each row, uh, the number of bytes in each row, and then times the index, which is this first index here. One, and that gets us to the beginning of the indexed row. Once we're there, we need to advance forward to find the appropriate digit, and that's going to be at four times the digit because the size of each of those digits is four bytes. So that is the calculation that we're trying to come up with here. But we so one way to do this would be to run the multiplier to get 20 times the index, then run the multiplier to get four times the digit, and then to add these two together and then these two together. A whole, whole lot of calculation that needs to take place. In particular, uh, it's going to have to use the multiplying hardware twice, which is pretty expensive. So the compiler is smart enough in this case to do some factoring. So it recognizes that it can actually factor a four out of here and brings that out to the beginning of this, of this offset calculation and chooses instead to implement four times the index plus the digit, five times the index plus the digit. So we can see how that actually plays out here looking at the assembly code. So first of all, this first load effective address, it's gonna take RDI, well, and let's go back here and make sure that we identify these guys. The first argument to the function is going to be stored in RDI. The second argument to the function is going to be stored in RSI. That's just our ordinary convention for function calling. So the first thing we're doing here is RDI plus RDI times 4, which is going to be the same thing as 5 times RDI, and we're going to store that in RAX. Again, we're going to return RAX back from this function, so we might as well just use it as our working register from the beginning. So that takes care of calculating um, this portion of the, uh, the address. Now what we need to do is add the offset according to the digit that we're interested in. And all we're going to do there is just use the, the adder. So let's run the adder, and we're going to take RAX, which has 5 times the index, and add to it RSI, which is the digit offset, and it'll store the result back in RSI. So that's just an ordinary addition operation. And that completes the calculation of this expression. We still need to multiply that result times 4, because we're, we, we've distributed that 4 to the outside here. Um, and what we're going to use to do that, again, is the, the, um, the address calculation. So here's RSI, which has 5 times the index plus digit. And we're going to say take 0 plus that times 4. So that's where we apply the multiplier of 4 up here and store the result back into the A register. Um, we're also going to 
apply the offset of the beginning of the array, right? This this is the displacement that we've looked at, that big D. Sorry, that looks like a outlet or something. Uh, it's the big D, so we're going to take the displacement, which contains the beginning of the array, plus the offset that's necessary to get to the beginning of the item that we're interested in in the array, and we're going to not just do the address calculation like we did up here in the load effective address. We're actually doing this in a move instruction. So this is going to calculate the address of an integer, and it's going to it's going to bring that integer in and store it in the A register. What we want to get back is not the address of something. We want to get back the actual value that's stored at index of dig of Grant County, and that will uh, this move instruction will fetch that out of RAM and return it from the function.